Here's a little bit about under the hood of what we see in an Extreme I.O. brick. So each controller has 16 cores of compute and 256 gig of RAM. So on the left, uh, this is actually an EMC uh, diagram, and they, even though they call them controllers, SPA is storage processor A, SPB is storage processor B. Again, remember those names mean the same thing. Um, and each one of these has two CPUs in it. So each storage processor, they're basically mirrored. So if you look at SPA, he has two eight-core CPUs, Intel Xeons. He has 256 gig of RAM. He has a SAS 2.0 bus over to the disks. And on the back, he has two fiber channel and two iSCSI ports. SPB has the same thing. So total, you get 16 cores of compute, or I'm sorry, 32 cores of compute total, and 512 gig of RAM total uh, between the two. Uh, and you get a total of eight ports, as we just discussed, two by FC, two by iSCSI, and 25 SSDs. Those two storage processors are connected via a technology called InfiniBand. InfiniBand has been around a long time. Uh, some people thought it would be the successor to the old one gig Ethernet. We actually had 20 and 40 gig InfiniBand long before we had really had a 10 gig Ethernet out in the world. Uh, but there were some issues. There were some, you know, vendor issues and standard issues and all that stuff. But InfiniBand is making a comeback. And it does in Finiband what's called RDMA, Remote Direct Memory Access. So the two controllers can basically read and write each other's memory directly over a very high-speed interconnect. Very high speed, and Infiniband is known for very, very low latency. So it makes for the perfect interconnect between these two controllers. If you have multiple bricks, you'll have multiple connections to that Infiniband uh, interface. And as I said a minute ago, uh, you have both FC, Fiber Channel, and iSCSI, 2 by 8 gigabit FC, 2 by 10 gigabit iSCSI right there um, on the back of each controller. Cluster communication, as you add multiple bricks, you again extend out that InfiniBand interface. You'll actually install a switch that goes in the rack with these guys, and you'll connect to that. If you only have a single brick with two controllers, you actually cable those controllers directly to each other. When you add the next brick, you'll add the InfiniBand switch. So let's talk a little bit about use cases. Why would I want this thing? Well, you know, if you're still looking around the market to figure it out, some ideas for use cases. If you've already bought your Extreme I.O. and you're listening to this to understand how to deploy and use it, hopefully you've already got your use cases figured out, but you may not. Um, you can easily, you know, extend these things. It's very common for us to come in and talk to a customer with one use case, and all of a sudden there's five use cases because it's so flexible and fast. There really is no magic use case for Extreme I.O., uh, just something that you want a lot of IOPS. And that's funny because we've, uh, you know, I've definitely worked with customers who just their use case was, I got a bunch of VMs. Uh, I have a big VMware environment and we're doing a, we need a new storage array. Ours is going out on maintenance and we want something that's easy and can give us better performance. Okay. All flash array, extreme IO, uh, very simple. Often there are other projects uh, that drive adoption like of this, including virtual desktop infrastructure, VDI. If you've never been through a VDI project, what you'll find is that storage is often um, maybe licensing, but often storage is the first or second largest cost to a VDI project. And most VDI projects, when they if they fail, uh, they fail due to storage, uh, mainly around performance. It's, it's very hard to properly architect a VDI storage environment. Uh, if you have 500 VDI clients and people come in on Monday morning, it's not a cliche thing. This really happens. All of a sudden, 500 people log in to the Windows desktops, and it just hammers the backend storage. Well, what if I can give you, you know, 150,000 IOPS immediately in less than one millisecond of latency? That's that's why we start to see these use cases here. High transaction databases. You know, if you have a busy, busy database, it likes IOPS, and this thing can hand it IOPS all day long. So we see people start to moving a lot of these what we call tier one applications over to this type of array to get that kind of performance. Large mixed workloads. These is the first one I talked about. Uh, you just have a lot of VMs, a lot of different performance requirements all over the board. If you get tired of managing that, different LUNs, different volumes for different performance levels, different RAID types, different disk types, you can just move to something like an Extreme I.O., and get very good performance without having to deal with RAID groups and disk sets and all that stuff. 
just move it over and immediately you've got high performance and low latency. We will talk a little bit here about expected dedupe ratios. Uh, you need to be careful. Databases don't often dedupe well. So a uh, very common use case is we have a database. It needs better storage performance. We're tired of doing these convoluted array configurations. Let's do something like Extreme IO. Well, how big is your database? Well, we got a bunch of databases. They total about 20 terabyte or more or 50 or 80 terabyte. Well, the problem here is that um, deduplication works really well in some environments and on some types of data. With databases, it's, uh, it's hit or miss. So my suggestion is EMC has a tool that will do an estimation of your deduplication uh, ratio. So if you get like five to one, that means, you know, a five terabyte database will dedupe down to one terabyte. So it'll give you that estimate. It's very rare to see a database do five to one. Uh, three to one is usually the outside goal. And sometimes it's, it's you know, 1.1 or 1.5 to one. You also need to check and make sure you don't do things like compressing tables within a database or encrypting tables. Anytime you compress or anytime you encrypt, it adds a lot of randomness to the data, meaning it makes it very unique. Even the same text in fields will end up looking different and that totally kills your dedupe ratio. So keep that in mind. Uh, one thing that you may want to find out if you can do a proof of concept with one of these boxes is to move your own data over to it and see um, realistically what kind of dedupe ratio you get. But understand that not everything dedupes as well as others. VDI usually is exceptionally well. Why? Because I got like 500 copies of the same Windows 8 desktop um, and they all dedupe down to very, very good ratios. So that's why VDI is the number one uh, project that drives this I put up top. If without dedupe, we'd have to do things like linked clones with VMware View or just buy a lot of capacity depending on the type of desktop images you needed. But dedupe is kind of an equalizer there. And that's how you take something that is a fairly expensive storage solution being all flash and make the cost in a VDI environment very reasonable because you can take a thousand VDI clients and desktops and put them on a single brick. And all of a sudden you've got the cost of that brick divided by a thousand different users and that cost per user becomes very reasonable.